Water shapes our world. Life as we know it cannot exist without water, at least not for an extended period of time. And yet too much water can be an impediment to survival as well. Water management is critical to sustainable, healthy landscapes, particularly in an increasingly challenging environment. Ben Franklin once said, if you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. Well, the same is true of water management. Poor water management leads to declining landscapes, higher expenses, and potentially lost business. But don't worry, our experts are here to help. Hi, I'm Mark Jackson, Water Management Consultant for the Navy Institute. In this five-part series, Water Specialists will share with you how water impacts the landscapes that we care for. Join us and discover water use efficiency methods that will help improve your landscape while actually using less water. Water, one of the most plentiful and essential compounds on Earth. Life can't exist without water, at least not for very long. Therefore, it's something we interact with and use every day. On your property, water is critical for keeping your landscape healthy and vibrant. But too much water is also seen as a nuisance. So over the centuries, humans have tried our best to move as much of it as we can off our property as quickly as possible. But what happens when we treat something as important to life as water the same way we treat garbage? Hi, my name is Tom Ludwig, and I'm a landscape architect with the Davey Resource Group. Today I'm going to talk to you about the health of our water resources, why it's important, and the different ways that you can keep the water on your property healthy. But in order to do this, we need to understand where the water on our property comes from, a process that's called the hydrologic cycle. The most direct experience we all have with the hydrologic cycle is the water that falls from rain. So that's where we will begin. When rain lands on our property, the first thing it encounters is vegetation, mostly trees, shrubs, and grasses. The vegetation intercepts the rain, slowing its descent from the sky and even keeping some on leaves and stems. The rainwater that reaches the ground soaks into the soil, where the roots of plants will draw it out. This process initiates transpiration, which is when water is released in the atmosphere by plants during photosynthesis. The remaining water in the soil becomes groundwater, and as gravity slowly pulls through the soil, it is cleansed of any impurities it may have picked up on the surface, kind of like a giant filter. Groundwater flows through the soil until it reaches a stream or river. Have you ever wondered why a stream will have water in it even though it hasn't rained? It's because the stream is fed from groundwater seeping out of the soil, which is called base flow. Base flow in creeks and streams is a good indicator of a healthy hydrologic cycle. Water then flows through the rivers and streams to lakes and oceans, where it can be evaporated by the sun and condensed in the atmosphere back into purified rain that falls on our property. Thus, the cycle is complete. The result is ample, clean, fresh, reliable water, and we don't even have to lift a finger for it. As we all know, water is essential for all life. So a properly functioning hydrologic cycle is important for the health of the water, soil, and plants on your property. In a perfect world, the hydrologic cycle would exist in a vacuum without any human interference. But we don't live in a perfect world. Humans have altered the hydrologic cycle in a myriad of ways which negatively impacts the health of our water resources. In watersheds developed by people, rain still falls, but that's where things start to change. Instead of being intercepted by vegetation, rain hits roofs, streets, and parking lots. These surfaces are impervious, which means they do not allow rainwater to pass through them into the ground. We've designed our infrastructure to channel water directly into gutters, pipes, and storm drains to get it off our property as quickly as possible. Along the way, the fast-moving water picks up garbage and pollutants from people, cars, industry, and farming. The rainwater never has an opportunity to soak into the ground, and instead the polluted water is channeled directly into local waterways, completely skipping the long filtration process in the groundwater stage of the natural hydrologic cycle. Also, in places like Northeast Ohio, where stormwater pipes are combined with sanitary sewers, overflows of the system will often dump raw sewage directly into our streams, rivers, and lakes. This stream hydrograph describes the result, which is that a much larger volume of contaminated water at a high velocity is going directly into our water bodies over a very short period of time. In developed watersheds, peak flows can be up to five times greater than pre-development levels. Our natural waterways are not capable of handling the high velocity and volume of water that we pipe into them, which leads to flooding and erosion issues downstream. Even when it doesn't rain on your property, the effects of development can still be felt. Since stormwater on developed properties can completely skip the groundwater stage of the hydrologic cycle, there is less groundwater available for your soil, landscape, and trees during dry months. 
Also, without groundwater, there is no base flow in streams and rivers. Without base flow, waterways become stagnant, which leads to foul odors and a perfect habitat for mosquitoes to breed. In agricultural and highly managed areas, stormwater runoff can be laden with fertilizers and excess nutrients. One may think this is a good thing for the environment because fertilizers help plants grow. However, organisms like algae thrive in nutrient-rich environments and the result can be massive algae blooms after rain events. Some algae can even be toxic and can poison our drinking water. When these massive algae blooms eventually die off, the dead algae is eaten by oxygen-consuming bacteria. As bacteria feed on the dead algae, the bacteria uses all of the available oxygen in the water, leaving little oxygen for aquatic life like fish. This is a process called eutrophication, and it is what is causing the massive dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico and many other large bodies of water across the country. Since water is the basis of all life, changes in the hydrologic cycle affect local and regional ecologies. When streams and waterways become flashy, polluted, and unpredictable, cycling between dry and flooding, they struggle to support any life. Would you want to drink water from a source where nothing can live? The result is we spend billions of dollars across the country every year to clean our water so it is safe to use on our property to drink, wash, and irrigate, even though it was given to us clean when it fell from the sky as rain. Then, we spend more billions to clean up after floods and fix erosion issues. Although it may seem difficult not to disrupt the hydrologic cycle on your site, there are actually many best management practices you can use to prevent the worst outcomes from development. The purpose of these may seem counterintuitive, but the point is to keep as much water on site as possible. Best management practices, or BMPs, should start when the project starts. Development should preserve and maintain on-site pre-existing drainage patterns whenever possible. Planning to cluster development away from critical hydrologic features like wetlands and springs will keep the cycle from being cut when your project is built. These features can be preserved as open space for tenants and residents. It could also be as simple as planting trees. As mentioned earlier, trees and vegetation are critical elements of a functioning hydrologic cycle. They intercept rain with their leaves, draw water from the soil with their roots, and transpire it back into the air during photosynthesis. During construction, Make sure your project has a stormwater and pollution prevention plan in place to prevent stormwater and sediment from getting into local waterways. Once construction is complete, there are several strategies to make your property act like a natural one. They include detention, retention, infiltration, and capture and reuse. The detention of stormwater on site can take many forms. Retention ponds, or wet ponds, are designed to always have water in them and can be a beautiful addition to any development. Detention basins, or water quality basins, are designed to collect and slowly release water after rain events, mimicking the infiltration rate of the pre-development site. This is a critical step. Just as fast-moving water tends to pick up pollutants and sediments, slow-moving water will drop these impurities, so detention areas actually act much like a filter. These can even take the form of constructed wetlands. This parking lot contains several best management practices, including bioswales, rain gardens, and permeable pavers. These pavers have holes between them which allow rainwater to infiltrate during rain events. Green roofs are also a great way to decrease your impact on the hydrologic cycle. They don't just cool buildings and save on energy costs, they also can intercept and slowly release rainwater. Plants act like natural filters of stormwater. They provide a rough surface on the landscape that slows down the flow of stormwater, and their roots act like conduits, pulling the water into the ground. Slowing stormwater also prevents erosion and pollution by decreasing the velocity of water and allowing it to drop out pollutants and excess nutrients that it may carry. The use of beneficial specialty planting and stormwater retention is called bioretention, and the aesthetic beauty of these systems combined with their effectiveness have made them popular solutions for stormwater management. Bioretention features include grassy swales, rain gardens, vegetated filter strips, tree box filters, and tree planters. When used effectively, and in combination with one another, these low-impact and low-cost strategies can even reduce the need for expensive constructed features like drainage structures and high-cost piping. Finally, even the landscape maintenance practices we use can have an impact on the hydrologic cycle. Irrigation systems should be designed not to turn on when there is adequate rainfall or during rain events. This can be accomplished with the use of soil sensors. This not only decreases the amount of runoff on site, but is a clear cost-saving strategy. After all, rain is free, municipal water is not. Also, planting design can be very important to the hydrologic cycle on your property. Planting a diverse palette of plants including trees, shrubs, and grasses 
provides a beautiful landscape and also a functional one. When bare areas of soil get hit by raindrops, the force of the impact loosens soil particles. The particles get suspended in stormwater runoff, and the result is that your property starts to erode and loses its soil, which can be very expensive to replace. The soil is carried into our waterways and can cause issues for aquatic life. Covering bare areas with vegetation or mulch will prevent raindrops from scouring your soil and will help prevent soil loss. The hydrologic cycle is a complex matrix unique to every region in sight, so it's impossible to get into all the details in such a short video. But I hope after watching today, you have a better understanding of all the impacts development can have on water quality and why it's important as developers and property owners that we do everything we can to mimic the natural hydrologic cycle on our sites and to stop abusing our most precious resource, water.